So there's a new movement in town, if you've not heard. It's called the National Interest Movement. It is a very interesting movement by the way it's been crafted, its ambitions, etc. We started a conversation last week when we were talking about the constitutional review process and we spoke to them as part of that. But we need to interrogate the movement a bit more for what it stands for and that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, and we're going to have a, an interesting conversation about what this movement is about, what they're trying to achieve. And let's get into what we know about this so far, just to lay the foundation for the conversation. When we sit, we start asking the questions, you have a certain background to it. So the National Interest Movement, that's your name. And they are demanding for the amendment of the several articles in the 99 Constitution, right? And so for them, you need to anchor this on constitutional reform, and they've isolated a whole range of issues that are, implanted, that are important uh, to them. Article 86, it provides for the establishment of the NDPC. For them, it's key that we have a national development plan that is binding on all of us and, and successive governments. Article 87, it provides for the functions of the NDPC, etc. Um, so this is key. But I find this overarching um, uh, uh, goal of what they intend to achieve very interesting and they state that the NIM is a civil society platform to rally support for an independent alternative to Ghana's electoral duopoly. That for me is pretty fascinating. That's the thing that caught my attention because it's the, the, the use of the word civil society but it is largely for a political cause, some may suggest. We'll get into that shortly and break it down. How they, they, they intend to navigate this very interesting, um, you know, piece of combining many very separate aspects of, of I guess, doing things in Ghana. It, it's pretty unique in the, what they're what they trying to do. So we'll try and get into that very shortly, if you stay with me. The objective is it's to r radical change, right? It's, it's to radically change one Ghana's system of governance. And I like the use of the word radical. What, what exactly is it? How are they defining radical? We'll get into that. Ghana's economy and its social attitudes for a more inclusive and pro prosperous society for all. Have we had this before? Have I the set same? So what is new about them? We'll get into that. Now, two. They also, NIM's agenda, demands significant constitutional reforms. We've touched on that key for them. A proposed reforms to be captured in the document that will be People's Charter for a more progressive nation. Is that to suggest that they don't believe that what we have currently is progressive? The proposed reforms, seven reforms in general we've isolated here. Uh, we say a restrained dominance of the executive president. So they want to kick the powers of the executive president. Social... Uh, reconstruction through nationally aligned education and compulsory military service for the youth. That is one of those very interesting things to also examine. Uh, a realistic and genuine uh, devolution of financial and political power to the regions. So this is new thinking, by the way. But how realistic are these in this current society um, that we find ourselves in, as some have suggested and said? We really effectively run a two-party state in Ghana. And, and so how will this feed into that? Is this idealism? Is this wishful thinking? We're going to get into that with a man who has been, who has done it and seen it all when it comes to these things. He's my guest tonight. Stay tuned if you want to know who he is. Assuming you haven't followed all our social media promotions tonight. He's my guest after the break. Just stay tuned. So my guest in the studio, um, you may recognize his face. He is Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. He is a founder, National Interest Movement, um, who of course is joining us in the studio. Um, you see him, and you, uh, but I know him somewhere. You definitely do. Um, your eyes aren't deceiving you because he's been front and center of Ghanaian politics for a long, long time. One time he led the CPP, um, Krumah's party, and so that is where you knew him from, and so your eyes are deceiving you, but he's tonight on the show as the, uh, the founder of the National Interest Movement. 
Doc, thank you very much for joining us on PMX. Thank you. It's I'm, been a pleasure. I'm, I'm delighted to have you. So I am. So let's start with the national interest movement. Yeah. You say on your website, it is a civil society platform mm. to rally support for an independent alternative to Ghana's electoral duopoly. Mm. This is a civil society with a political ambition. How do you combine that? Well, it has a political agenda, which is to open up the political space occupied by the duopoly at this time. So the objective is a broader, more inclusive democracy. That does not mean that it is going to occupy this, that place as, as a party. I think that is the distinction a lot of people find so difficult. So you to... are the facilitator yes, of the we want, of the duopoly. We want to facilitate the process by which the political space opens up through electoral reforms, are you with me, that will cause that space to open up because we have seen that the effect of our democracy as we have it now under the 1992 constitution has been to collapse that political space. Where in 1992, when there was 11% achieved by a party that was not NDC or MPP, it has now contracted that almost seven political parties cannot even get 1%. And in fact, they get more than the number of spoiled votes. Mm. So that tells you that that political, that democracy is having a certain impact on the political landscape. And if you want to correct that so that you have broader inclusion, then you have to take certain measures in the electoral uh, process and the electoral reforms to create that space. Is it your assumption that once, assuming you succeed to create these reforms, somehow, naturally, a third force will emerge? Well, put it this way. If we, you will recall that since we have been voting, we have had uh, to go a second round at least two times, yeah. if not three times. Yeah. In those two or three times, if the constitution allowed for formation of coalitions, then another party would have come with its votes to form a coalition with whoever had the most votes. Mm. And it would have been in government championing a particular cause for which it will get recognized and in time its support base will grow. But we don't have that option. Mm. So we go and vote again until somebody gets 50% plus one. And then the political space shuts because it's winner takes all. So it is the very practice of the democracy as we have it that has closed the political space. But Doc, we, we, we had a situation in the 90s where Akar's party yes. joined forces with the NDC, but he became a vice president. Yes. So that door is still shut. No, but you see, the point here is that it has to be an institutional collaboration, not a personal collaboration. We've even had occasions when some members have been made ministers sure. in Doom, etc. But that was uh, them as individuals. How did it affect the standing of their party, <laughs> are you with me, and its institutional partnership? So that is what we have to correct. We have this, elect this process is focused too much on individuals and positions and not on the institution or the political parties themselves. So if you create opportunity for the political parties to have formal you know, partnerships and coalitions, then they can be in government, prosecute agendas that will indeed let the electorate know that I didn't spoil my vote. I was very interested in water, and even though they are only 10% of government, they've delivered on the water agenda. This is how other democracies have broadened and be more inclusive. If you look over Europe, you see all kinds of <laughs> you know, coalitions, seemingly small groups, yeah. really punching above their weight, because the agenda for which they are known, Greenpeace or whatever, Green Party, they are very vociferous and vocal about it, and it doesn't stop at the political side. They even go down into, you know, uh, what would I say, volunteer work and civil society work because that is the nature of that kind of movement. It's not purely for political purposes. Explain to me, for the skeptics who hear a civil society organization mm. mobilizing to, for a political cause, mm. They say this is an ancestral relationship that you are beginning to have between oh. a civil society group. Because civil societies are defined by their apolitical nature. Well, the, the This would be a pretty unique yes. way of trying to blend the civil society 
Well, that you're blurring the line that, that should exist between civil society and politics. I don't think it is a blurred line because, first of all, any of the civil society organizations, pick any of the activities that they do, are these not done by government? <laughs> That's number one. Number two, if the purpose of that civil society is to affect the lives of people uh, in a different way uh, through political means, but not as a political organization, then it's a purely legitimate, it's an entirely legitimate process. I guess because that's the question, how, what, how do what, you achieve that? Well, what we are saying is how that we are pushing for reforms, you see? Okay. We are pushing for reforms that have political implications. Mm. That does not mean we are going to execute those reforms as a political group. We are pushing for those reforms because, put it this way, we know, all know that the Constitution has been reviewed in the Constitutional Review Report. We know a white paper has been, you know, uh, written, uh, but it was there gathering dust. With the support of some of those who wrote it and other CEO, CSOs who were interested in this and had some were interested in, you know, different issues, but we brought them together. And what NIM has done is to provide wheels, are you with me, for this document to start now moving into the homes of individuals for debate and also to solicit their support for them to go and, you know, uh, confront their parliamentarians and say, look, I want you to talk about this in parliament. This affects me in this way and this way and this way. That is the awareness that a civil society organization does. We're not saying vote for anybody. We're saying be aware of how this constitutional reform affects you and ensure that you tackle your politicians because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are the gatekeepers to the political decisions. So to say that, you know, it is political is what maybe somebody would use to scare us, are you with me, from doing what has been left undone. But it is entirely legitimate to seek reforms, be they political, social, or otherwise, that will raise the uh, level of consciousness in the society for the right things to be done, because it affects all of us. Can I respectfully put to you yes. that there's no amount of reforms to the Constitution, be it what is already in the white paper or what name is going to add, that can weaken these two political parties as we have it enough to create the space for a third one? Well, put it this way. Our objective is not weakening the two political parties. Our objective is strengthening you as a Ghanaian mm. to know what is your right, how to demand it, and if in demanding it, you are able to change the political landscape, are you with me, or, or, or change the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, political system and the reform, f through the reforms, then you are able to get what you want out of the system. What I can also put it to you, and it's the other way, mm -hmm. is that, you know, you can vote and vote and vote forever. This duopoly will stay the same until there are political reforms and electoral reforms that open so up the So the big question space. then, so which specific reforms do you believe, if implemented, will create that space, as you say, to have this alternative that brings well, Ghana's electoral draw policy. First of all, our objective is not only mm. about the political, about the electoral reforms. Mm. It is one okay. of a group. Yeah. And one of the key things that we have made very clear is that if you don't undertake a comprehensive reform and you only tinker with a small part of it here and leave the rest of it unattended to, you are not going to get much returns for your effort. So the first thing to make very clear is that this is not only about electoral reforms, mm. but about some other major reforms to remove major impediments, such as the excessive uh, powers of the presidency, mm. the one man thousand presidency, <laughs> and its effects. Let's go to some of the specifics yes. of those. Yes. I mean, because um, cause isolate for me your top reforms that will have the most impact in achieving the objectives you've yeah. laid out. You've just started with, let's start with what you just touched yes. on. Um, well, clipping the wings of the president, reducing his well, power. Well, I, would, I wouldn't put it 
as clipping the wings of the president because in some instances, we actually want the president to have more power. Okay. We want the president to be free to appoint whoever he wants as his minister. We mm. don't want him constrained to appoint them only from parliament. Mm. So that is one incidence. However, we do also say uh, that we want the uh, president to have less influence on the constitutionally independent bodies. Therefore, the appointment of peoples to those constitutionally independent bodies and the mechanism of funding those independent bodies should have nothing to do with him. <laughs> Are you with me? Well, of course, not nothing to do with him literally, but should not primarily originate from him. And that alternative mechanisms such as, and this is interesting, a second chamber, which is a modified council of state, should be created with that authority vested in it, in addition to the oversight uh, you know, role that it should have over the first chamber, so that these people are appointed through that uh, independent uh, second chamber and funded through direct levies from uh, our, our revenue. That way, you have a situation where the person is not afraid, are you with me, to do their job independently. That is a built-in mechanism. Now, what you are telling me is that because it is so far-fetched and it is so idealistic. So you agree it's far-fetched and idealistic? No, I'm saying the, the response okay. I get from people, mm. oh, that it is so far-fetched that we should continue to play football with each person bringing their referee to the match. Now, how realistic is that? <laughs> Are you with me? In terms of having a system that has high level of integrity, impartiality, and you can have the confidence in that system that it will deliver totally impartially. So if you want certain things to happen, you have to be prepared, <laughs> are you with me, to make alternative arrangements to the situation that has produced them. And if you're not prepared to do that, then you're saying we will just stay with the status quo. And staying with the status quo has its own consequences in time. And they are not small consequences, because at the end of the day, if you have a situation in which two parties, if not even a third party, feel that they, they are never going to get a chance because the system is so loaded against them, you know what happens, what happens? <laughs> eventually. What happens? Eventually, they put sand in the gari, <laughs> and mm. both of us can't eat it. Mm. Are you with me? So we don't want that situation. So why don't you preemptively, preemptively, make the kind of reforms, are you with me, that will ensure that we keep moving and advancing our democracy forward and redefining it in such a way that there's greater inclusion, there's a broadening of the space, there's greater transparency and greater meritocracy. Are these bad things to happen? Let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, we already have, in the last elections, we had a whole host of political parties on, on, the, on, the, on the ballot. Isn't that enough? I mean, why, why, uh, the system is, is okay. If it's not broken, don't fix it. If it ain't broken, don't well, fix it. Uh, let, let me ask you a question. You had a whole lot of political parties. Mm. Other than NDC and MPP, what percentage of the vote did but those that's, parties that get? Is, that is democracy. No, it's The not. people's choice. No, that They had the alternatives and yeah. decided we just wanted two. Well, yeah, yeah, that that's has no, nothing to do with the system we no, have. No, that, that basically tells you. You see, we have to, to, to analyze uh, results beyond what they appear uh, to be. The fact of the matter is that if you don't have a system where, you know, these smaller groupings can be included, but they, they are already included. No, they are just no. included in the voting. Democracy is not putting your ballot in the box. But that's the, the ultimate expression of democracy. No, it's not the ultimate democracy. It's choosing the sovereign. No, the ultimate demo the expression of democracy is in having the kind of society that you want. Yes, and you vote through the it. ballot box. It, it, through the ballot. It is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. <laughs> yes, it, it, yeah. So but at the end of the day... It can be an end in itself. No, it cannot be an end because in Because at the end of the day, if it the, is if the means doesn't deliver the end, yeah. you go back to the ballot box and you change that. Well, that either that or you change the processes 
and the mechanisms by which you go through the ballot but, box. But, the ballot, but even the change you're proposing yes. will come to the ballot box at the referendum. Well, yes, and that is why we're saying that this is not a matter of leaving up to only the parliamentarians or the executive. This is a matter of Ghanaians themselves to realize that ultimately the power of the constitution is vested in them. And if they want a change, they have to get up and push for that change. If they all push for that change, nobody because of their party can deny them that change because they are the people who put them in there. So now we have a situation where through the awareness that we have in communities, first of all, telling people, look, this is our objective. These are the things that are important. Mm. This is how this affects your life. So you're going around sharing leaflets. Yes. One of them that I have in my hand yes. says, demand referendum, hashtag change our constitution, reform our democracy now. When you're handing this to the people and telling them what? Well, we're telling them that, look, uh, because of the way things are now, this is how your life is affected. If you want to change how meritocracy works in the system, a who you know system, are you with me? Mm. And everybody knows what I mean when I what I mean by when I say who you know. If you if you say meritocracy, they may not understand. But if you want to change the system of who you know to get what you want, then you must build that into the system. If you want to change a Didija politics where you have only one group enjoying themselves and the other group out of the box, you must change these reforms in order to have greater. In inclusion. what specific ways are you asking them to make this change? Well, first of all they can only make the change by demanding for it. And they have to append their signature to the petition that they will take and deliver to their members of parliament, book a, a date with him, and go through those things with him as they understand Are they it. a member of parliament? Yes, in, in, it in begins Ghanian, there. In a Ghanaian constituency. It begins there. Why do, why do parliamentarians have constituency offices? Is it not to engage? They don't have constituency offices. Well, they should do. But they don't have constituency And offices. even if they don't have constituency offices, you can meet them in their house. Yeah, but they'll meet them in their house to get money to pay the school fees well, or, or marry their second wife. Well, I wouldn't... No, no, they wouldn't go I to the I MP's house and go and discuss. I, you know what happens. I wouldn't, this is reality, no, no, no. I wouldn't reduce all Ghanaians to the lowest common denominator. No, but there it's are a many, reality. No, no, there are many Ghanaians, I tell you, there are many Ghanaians who are very conscious. They don't need... They the middle-class Ghanaian, yes. yes. So, but a middle-class Ghanaian will hardly walk to his MP's office. Well, these are, these, believe it or not, these are the people when we are engaging on the streets who are most receptive of this. And they feel like they've not, they don't have an avenue, are you with me, to express these. So having this now gives them an avenue. I had somebody who told me, look, I finished the leaflets. I went to a funeral, started talking to people. <laughs> Are you with me? And they all came, I finished the leaflets. The only thing is I stopped them from forming a queue because it's not appropriate to form a queue. And they so they feel the leaflets. <laughs> and your intention is to gather enough to do what with it? Well, first of all, uh, I have often heard it said that, oh, we're, we're gathering the signatures to force the hand of the president. But that's not what you're doing? No, we are gathering the signatures to demand from the member of parliament. You know, you sitting in your constituency, you cannot reach all the way to the president, but you can demand from your member of parliament that he table these reforms with a view that we will have the processes needed for us to have a referendum in 2022 and implement the recommendations in 2023 before the election in 2024. So we've got a clear-cut agenda, we've got our work cut out for us, and it is going to require everybody to get involved. Even those who are pessimistic about it, are you with me? Yeah. Once they see the change coming and people begin moving, it comes. You see, at any one time, at any one time, you have the energy of the status quo which is always low. And then you have the energy of innovation and change, which comes to overpower the status quo. But it requires a push. It doesn't require lying in your bedroom and dreaming about how nice these things would be if we were to have them. It requires getting out 
meeting the people because this particular exercise is about the people of you, Ghana. You it's, say, you say yes. that NIM's objective is, quote, to radically change Ghana's system of governance. Mm. How radical? Well, it, there are a number of uh, constitutional reforms. First of all, we've talked about the top level. We need a second chamber. So instead of having a normal council of state as it is now, mm. let's have a different council of state in which uh, you would have people who have served in various established positions and distinguished themselves being uh, nominated and appointed to it. Some will be elected to it as they are now. Mm. Uh, but ultimately, it will be a body of substantive people and accomplished people who can take what has come from the parliament and read it, and who do not feel pressured to make particular decisions uh, without fear or favor. So at the end of the day, uh, this if you don't create such a medium, then how do you get something that is different? How do you get something that can resist? If you don't create such a medium, how will they appoint people, individuals, who are very independent. And if you have such a, 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 a structure behind you, then those independent people appointed can operate more independently. So there are structural changes. The next level that we're talking about is the, uh, what do you call it, the appointment of the civil servants and the CEOs, etc., which will be, you revise the Civil Service Commission and make sure everybody has a chance. Those jobs are advertised and people apply for them. Now, government yesterday on this same show, the yeah. chief executive of SIGA, Simon yeah. Simon uh, says, government is already doing this. They, they're actually well, opening up the process. Uh, we want to see done. We want to see done, uh, because we still see here of appointments being made. Mm. And also, you, you, mustn't cre you, you have to ensure that there's no conflict of interest. Mm. So you have to, it's not everybody who can be appointed. So it's not, these are some things, uh, these are things that we need to put together a group of people when we get beyond the phase of, okay, we have to change, then how does it change? That's another level of thinking that needs to go into it to make sure that it's institutionalized and it is robust. So we get there when we get there. The other level which is very important, which I must tell you, is that we have to have a proper decentralization that is economically viable. Mm. In other words, the decentralization to regions is important, bringing back local government to regions from districts because it has economy of scale. Two, because that is where the resident body of technocrats reside who can plan and execute. What is wrong with our current decentralized system? First of all, you have 260 odd districts and they are too many and too small to be economically viable. So they cannot have a strong enough tax base. How can base. it be too that many is why, and too small? Isn't that because well, there are too many that actually... No, because you see... You want to reduce the number. The tax base, if you, if you have many, many small, small pieces, the tax base, there's a minimum amount of tax you must collect to run independently. Yeah. So if you don't, if you can never achieve that, then what is the point of claiming? So that you're, you're running, you want to reduce the current number you, of districts? You, well, you will, do, you will just name them as sub-districts, are you with me? Mm and use the current 16 regions, which are big enough, and call those districts, bring the local government to them, and in time, expand those to about 30. These are some of the suggestions that we have. So you will have 30 new districts, but at the same time, you would now have universal suffrage election for the DCEs. So, so something that this government had tried On and- On a non-partisan basis. The other week, I heard you say this, and I really was dying to correct you. Mm -hmm. Government didn't try to do this. That's what government tried they to do. They tried to do it on partisan basis, yes. not on non-partisan basis. Yeah, but that was, a, that was a disagreement that killed it. No, it was, first of all, the Constitution Re Review Report did not say you should do it on partisan basis. Yeah. It recommended that you do it on non-partisan basis. Yeah, but I, I get it. But the gov government said they want to do it on partisan basis. The disagreement that killed it was the other side said, what you're saying, which is don't do it on partisan basis. Well, and that, that killed it. That, that not only the other side. So the side, disagreement no, was no, whether I, to do partisan or not. I think that it would not be fair to say that the other side disagreed. Initially, if you remember they the were process, all for they it. were all for it. Yes. Until it was evident that the general public and the CS didn't want the politics. Were politics very much against it. So when that no, so, sorry, they were not against the concept of 
No, they election. were against, against the partisan the nomination. Partisan of, yes. Policy, yes. We were very much for it. Yeah. And I was campaigning for it yeah. until that partisan election came out, at which point I did a full 360 and said no. And nobody could interpret that as being anti-government because when the president was creating regions, mm. I was fully in support of him mm. and campaigned with them to do it. Yeah. But that's another issue. If you campaign for something which you believe in and the government is doing it and it is going to be good for the people, why not? You don't have to be a member of that government to do it. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that you're now cross-border and you're a member of, the, of, of that party. Yeah. By the same token, if they're doing something that you don't agree with and you say, no, this one, that's not how I anticipated it, and you are against it, it does not mean that suddenly you are an anti-government person. Mm. These are some of the things that we have to bring in our body politic for our politics and our democracy to become a bit more mature, to know that we can disagree about something, but it doesn't mean that we're enemies are over it. <laughs> Who is funding this? This is being funded by members, is being funded by the general public and sympathizers. Who are the members? Oh, the members, we have many members. We have 200 members on our WhatsApp platform. Uh, who the who are the key ones apart the, from yourself? Well, oh, we have uh, Professor Tugba, who is there, Professor Raymond Jam uh, Jampo, we have uh, Susan Edua Mankwa, we have uh, uh, Madame Rowling, we have uh, uh, also uh, Charles Atugba, and several professors. Actually, there are a lot of professors in it. Mm. <laughs> One well, was this all your idea? Well, it wasn't entirely my idea in the sense that uh, we all felt the need, are you with me? People, mm. everybody felt the need that something needs to be done, something needs to change. The question was, how could it change? So I said, okay, why don't we go on a retreat? And why don't we ask, put aside politics, put aside ideology, uh, let, and put aside political traditions. Just as Ghanaians, let us ask ourselves, what are the key things that have stopped us from becoming what our contemporaries who have excelled above us have become? Let's write them down. And when you write these things down, you find that they emanate from our inability to organize as a collective, our desire for self-interest to predominate community interest, our desire for partisan interest to dominate national interest. That is why people don't accept the NDP, because they have their partisan, their partisan interests. Now, some of these things cannot exist, are you with me, coexist in a progressive society. In a progressive society, it must be the case. You're almost suggesting that our, our society currently is not progressive. Well, I think that we have stagnated. We've progressed to a certain point, but then we have stagnated because at the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. But, but if you look at how fast we, 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 we accelerated at the beginning of our republic, mm. uh, then we got into a turmoil and slowed down. Uh, meanwhile, the others, like the Koreas, the Singapores, were running alongside us. There may be several reasons, but all those reasons come down to certain principles which rely on, one, having a cohesive national vision, having continuity and consistency that accumulates the progress that is made, instead of having a situation where the progress that is made is dissipated. Mm. Let's come back to it, because all this mass mobilization demands resources. You say this is self-funded. Yes. Well, I mean, it, it, NIM funds itself. I mean, members fund NIM. Uh, the public can fund NIM. But as it is uh, now, we, your, the, the key members are funding it. The key members are funding it. And also, we're getting small, small donations. As a matter of fact, if you go on our website, you'll see these posters and the T-shirts. Ten posters and one T-shirt is 30 Ghana CDs. So you're selling it? So we're selling it. So if we give you a, a T-shirt, we expect you to bring that 30 CDs back so we can get another one and give it to the next person. If we give somebody a bunch of leaflets to canvas in their area, 10 T-shirts and 100 you know, leaflets, when you finish, bring back the cost of that so we can fund the, the, the next person next to you. So this is something that we want people to feel that they own it. We want people to do the legwork for it. 
and we want people to be able to support How it. many foot soldiers, I use that word advisedly, <laughs> have you deployed on this? Because there are people yeah. on the, yeah. with boots on the ground doing yeah. this for you. Well, the point here is that we don't have so many foot soldiers. Everybody is a foot soldier. I myself was in the constituency working with them, etc. So in NIM, there's not, a, a, this is the hierarchy and they're sitting down sending the small boys to do this. No, we all get out, deploy ourselves and go on the, and if we meet somebody who's prepared to come along with us, we co-opt him into the process because at the end of the day, this is about you mm. and your future. And if you want to see those changes, you have to be prepared to fight for it. And we're not fighting on partisan basis. I'm going to take a break. When I come, we need to talk about what the elephant in the room. Many look at NIM and say they are simply a threat to the established political order. And what, what, no matter how you look at it, that's what the NDC and the people look at as us. And you know what politicians do when they feel threatened? They find ways to make sure that threat goes away. How are they going to face that? Because this is, on the face of it, everybody who enjoys from the status quo will not be happy with it. How are they dealing with that? You want to stay with me for that when we return from the break. My guest in the studio is uh, Dr. Busakara Foster, is the founder of the National Interest Movement. Uh, the dog. So, You've laid out what your ambitions are, but you've put the target on the backs of NDC and MPP by doing this, have you not? Well, no. What I have done is, uh, what we have done, is to raise the bar and raise the aspirations for the ordinary Ghanaian to reach beyond what he can get from any of the two groups now. And if what he can get is a new uh, system of governance, system of economy, and also the new social system that allows him to achieve more than he has achieved now. Why should it be against anybody? But because ultimately, this is, this is an alternative to both parties that well, you're pushing. It, it is not an alternative in the sense that it is an organized group of people seeking to displace NDC or MPP. It's an alternative that is an organized group of people seeking to create the political space and the awareness for Ghanaians to move in a direction that is more of the national interest rather than of partisan interest. Because right but, now... But you can only achieve the national interest as it is now through partisan means. It's well, just the way democracy works. Uh, that is not strictly true. Because at the end of the day, you, you seek government through partisan interests as we have it now. But in terms of fulfilling the desires of the people, you are supposed to be a president for all of us. You are supposed to be a parliamentarian. But isn't that what for all, all of them are? Well, if it, is only, is it is only the case if you, as an individual, demand what you want and organize other people to let them know that this is our priority. If, however, you relax, sit back, and rely on manifestos and party promises to give you what you have, you'll get the same result later. So now what we're saying to people is, don't just complain, okay? Mm. The power is in your hands. If you want the system to work, work more effectively, these are the things that you must do. You how, must seek these reforms. How would you respond to a critic who puts it to you yes. that the national interest movement is another political party in the making that is currently in disguise? Well, I would tell them categorically, first of all, if I wanted to form a political party, I would have formed a political party. I have decided categorically not to do that. Second is that when we formed the National Interest Movement, we were aware of the political divide in Ghana. We were also aware of the traditions and people's alliances. And we felt very acutely that we must have a vehicle that leaves this these old rivalries behind, if we are to reach forward into the future for a new kind of system. And therefore, we made it clear that the national interest movement will never, at any time, become a political party. You're saying that never will, will never become a political a, party. The national interest movement 
will never at any time become a political party. You will never party. register this for 2024 as a political no, party? No, at all. It is purely to ensure that the reforms, are you with me, that we all seek for our national interests come into being. But After doing that, if NDC, MPP or whoever, under these reforms, mm -hmm. wins an election, we shall be happy to work with them. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, so is the, that system, the, end game? the system, the end game, is that the system for whoever wins the election should be different. On the basis that if the system isn't different, whoever wins the election will not deliver anything different. Is this, um, Dr. Busakara Force still a member of the CPP? No, I am not. But you know, I resigned from the CPP more well, well, than six, six years ago. So you've yeah. completely left At all, the completely, of it. yes. yes. So are you a politician still? I think I'm a politician. I'm a political being. Uh, you know, Are you a partisan politician? I'm not a partisan politician. Now, right now, I'm focused on the reforms that we can do that will basically transform our democracy, redefine our democracy for the collective interest. Now, when you say, and I always tell the youth this, when you say, oh, no, I'm not a political being, I said, think of yourself as sitting in a boat with two teams paddling. There are hippos and crocodiles in the river. And you're telling yourself you don't care what, how the decisions are being made about how the boat is paddled. So when the boat tips into the river, will you suddenly <laughs> become a political being? So it is important. And really, it is just a glib saying. Everybody is a political being in one way or the other. Because what is politics? It's about the allocation of resources for your better conditions of living. That's all it is. So the name, you say categorically, will, will never become a political party. What about, what about individuals in name? Will, for but example, there, yourself... There are individuals now who belong to political parties. Yeah. There are individuals in do, name... Do you still have presidential ambitions? Well, not in that, in that sense. Uh, my particular uh, ambition right now is to see to it that these reforms come into being. Mm. And I think that that is the question. So you say that's not your ambition now, no. but that could change later. Well, depending on how well named any, does. Not depending on how well named does. It will depend on a whole lot of situations. And, you know, nobody, I'm not going to give anybody the luxury of saying, oh, a doctor is out, count him out. Never. By the same token, that is not my focus. If it was my but focus. But at least not for now. It was my focus. I would have contested as CPP presidential candidate. If it was my focus, I had opportunity to contest as an independent candidate. If it was my focus, Maybe I could you need a new vehicle to no. nurture the grassroots, build a base through name, and ride on that to, no. to run. Well, put it this that way. That sounds like a what, very plausible what, strategy. No, what I know for sure is that name is building the grassroots and nurturing the grassroots for all political parties to perform better in mm. government because that those reforms do not affect a particular mm. party they affect all of us mm. and this is why it's important to realize when you've been in the game for a while you say to yourself why aren't things changing even if we brought michael the archangel excuse those who may mm. think is blasphemous and the system was exactly the same as it is now would you intelligently expect a different result but some some say <laughs> very finally that the change you seek yeah. utopian wishful thinking never will it happen in this government. well the people also say that you are the change you seek so be the change you seek work for it and work towards it because the people there's the want, fact want, the people don't want well they they will tell you they do but they will not well act. we can't speak for the people when i see well, people accepting well, to do that's what the people well, have shown. Yeah, no, but you see... They've chosen two political parties the, back and forth. Yeah, but that is not a permanent situation. And it's getting uh, worse fact, because the other alternatives no, are, no, no, are no. reducing in vote no, consistency. But you see, forward. you're looking at a very small window of time. Which was the dominant political party after when Parliament started? It was the Liberals. Yeah. They dominated for ages. Now, where are the Liberals? Well, <laughs> define admit? for me in 30 seconds what <laughs> yes. the end game is. Well, the end game is a radically reformed system based on these comprehensive conditional, constitutional reforms that will usher in a new era of doing things differently and that will also lift the ceiling for what we can achieve as a nation. Okay. I think if we, if we are there, 
it really, for me, doesn't matter anymore who is in government because I know that we have removed the shackles from them mm. and they can perform better than what they could previously. Dr. Busakara Foster, thank you very much. You are welcome. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. My name is Kuju Yangson. Let me tell you how to turn back time. You can now bring back all the fun, all the excitement, all the controversy of the Super Morning Show and all your favorite joy shows when you go to myjoyonline.com forward slash podcasts. Just select your favorite show and bring it all back again. Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning Super listeners. Radio, radio. Joy 99.7. Hello and welcome to Springboard, a virtual university. Spike.